The man in black fled across the desert. The guns took a fire. Welcome back to Riders of the Dawn. This is Stu. This is Jay. What are uh, we talking today, about today? Today we're going to talk about specific environments and specifically deserts. Yeah, so <clears throat> how, how the environment affects the story, part of the setting, and a part of the setting that sometimes people view as window dressing and not something that needs to be really thought about. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think the reason we wanted to talk about deserts today is because it's a... Uh, it's an aggressive environment that, not aggressive, what am I thinking? Inhospitable. There you go. Environment that uh, oftentimes characters have to overcome themselves, where the, the desert itself is is an, antag- an antagonist, so to speak, uh, because there are obstacles um, above and beyond the plot that, that you have to get around just, just to survive. Yep. So, like the our opening quote here, uh, the man in black fled across the desert from Stephen King's The Gunslinger, <laughs> there are a certain set of challenges that your characters are going to have to overcome just to reach, like, minimum levels of achieving the plot. Um, and this is, this is why this portion of uh, setting is so important. This is not a this is not a window dressing. This is not like something you're just describing as your characters are walking by because oftentimes your characters are going to have to act differently because of this environment that they're in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to think. Um, you know, one of the things I think about is uh, you know any sort of Odyssey like story, which is really happens a lot in fantasy where you're going through different kinds of environments. Uh, the environment provides like a different you know, just a different part of the story. Um, And a lot of times characters go through deserts and there's never, like the deserts don't have an impact in the way that they really ought to have. And so the big thing about a desert, I think, is there's no water. Yeah. And I'm I'm, I'm not sure why, why do people, why are we seeing so many desert settings these days? Well, I think we see a lot of deserts because... It, it really ups the level of um, cooperation that characters have to have with one another. And, and either in the fact that they have to cooperate or that there's a major conflict and the desert is what is amping up that conflict. So I think a lot about Dune. Dune was the first desert setting science fiction or fantasy that, that I ever read. And the desert plays a huge role because you have you have a cast of characters who are civilized and they live in the city, and then you have an entire other cast of characters who are wild and free. Wild, they're like natives, and they're and they live in the desert, even though like no life should be able to live there. Yeah, but somehow that, they found a way. And the whole planet is so dry. It also kind of created the trope of the of the single environment planet. Right. Which when you think about, I mean, like, it, it happens all the time in Star Wars. It's like, it's the ice world of Hoth. It's like, there's an ice world on Earth. It's called, you know, Antarctica. Antarctica. <laughs> yeah. Right, so, any, <laughs> any planet that's likely to support life and have liquid water, it's likely also has a large number of biomes on it in different environments. Some of them will be desert, some of them will be frozen. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're, if you're going to say our earth is a good model for what is hospitable to life. Right. You know. Um, <clears throat> but I think one of the reasons you, you or, or authors choose to have a single, single environment planet is because exploring multiple environments within a story can, can cause reader fatigue. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's like the Odyssey setting, uh, you know, you have like a series of things that happen on your journey. Yeah, and I think the Odyssey, the Odyssey you can really look at as in this grander, larger act format, <clears throat> where each act kind of takes yeah. place each act in its, is its own, own little story. Yeah. yeah, and that's I mean that's part of what makes the Odyssey great. Is part of what makes it feel epic. Uh, each little each little island that Odysseus goes to teaches him a different lesson or conveys a different moral sensibility, <laughs> including like. Uh, 
you know, a lot of them, a lot of the big themes of the Odyssey is eating at the wrong time. <laughs> Which is, uh, maybe we'll talk about that some other time. Um, but yeah, you gotta, if you're gonna set your whole story in a desert, uh, the water is the big one. I'm trying to think if there's other stories that have really used the desert well. And the one, one that comes to mind from a movie is Flight of the Phoenix, the original they, re- they remade it a couple of years back, but the original was a movie from like the 50s or 60s, um, color movie, where basically um, a plane crashes in the Sahara. And in order to get out, they have to take this crashed plane and turn it into another plane. They have to <laughs> reassemble the parts into another plane to fly out of the desert. Wow. Uh, and the desert, obviously, it's really hot and inhospitable. They don't, you know, they can't, they, they they have no idea how far away they are from anything close to civilization or water. And they have a limited supply of water, so you're racing against the time. You're racing against the clock. And uh, when you run out of water, you're dead. Um, and if you take the, the chance to just try to walk out... You can get lost or never find never find the end and die. So you're you're weighing all these risks, and it kind of makes it so like you're in the middle of this sinking ship, yeah. uh, and the ship will sink when you're out of water. Um, and of course, you also have conflict with characters over like how much water should you have? Um, you know, who's going to take turns on this generator? They rig up this generator where you're pedaling this bicycle to like to like uh, light up the area so you can work work at night. Because you can't work during the day. It's too hot. It's too hot. It'll kill you. Um, they try to, like, walk out at one point, and they come back, and they're all sunburned. And the captain, uh, you know, there's an army captain. He dies, basically, from heat stroke. And um, they accidentally come across, when they're exploring, like, a group of um, of Arabic traders on camels. Mm-hmm. This takes place during, like, World War II, when that kind of thing kind of still happened in the Middle East, because the Middle East was so non-modern at that point. And uh, someone's like, well, let's go talk to him and, and, you know, maybe they'll help us get out of here. And they're like, no, we can't do that. And someone's like, well, I'm going to go talk to him. And of course, of course, the Arab traders kill him as they would like any intruder or person that come to steal their stuff. Yeah. Um, and so like, you know, they learn this lesson that like not only no one's no one can rescue us. Yeah. No one's going to come rescue us. It's like if, without that desert setting, you just wouldn't have you couldn't have the story. Yeah. Couldn't have that story without the desert setting. Yeah. So with with Dune, if we look back on that world, uh, one of the things that the the society has developed to offset this desert desert world is are these suits that recycle water from your body, which is um, I think it's it's one of the most important science fiction elements in Dune. Is this, is this suit technology that basically filters waste and sweat. The still uh, suit, yeah. Yeah, and really makes them, makes it so that they can they Preserve can a lot more moisture, yeah. Yeah, because moisture is, and one of the, you know, so that's, that's a big part of the science fiction element. Another part, which is a cultural element, is how much they value water. So if they spit it's not an insult. It's actually a um, a sign of commitment because they're giving up their moisture. Yeah, because they're giving up their moisture. Um, so there's there's a lot of really cool cultural elements that come out of that. And you know, of course, then they they kind of worship these sandworms that create the spice, and that really really makes the makes the world what it is. It makes the universe what it is of this spice uh, and you're really working around this it's like the the most inhospitable planet in the universe is the center of everything in the universe yeah everything that's important which is that spice because the entire economy is built on it yeah uh, there'd be no interstellar travel without it which I think they explore in later books yeah um, it's just like a massively important thing so yeah it's a and um not not only is it it's so inhospitable that like the people in that city in the north they just never really go into the deep desert 
yeah. because it's just so dangerous. And then, of course, you add, you add the danger of the sandworm. The sandworm is is going to try to eat. It's going to try yeah. to eat you. Yeah. So, it's like tremors. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the, you have the giant doom sandworms are going to are going to eat you up, uh, adding an extra extra element of danger to where like just running on the sand can be a dangerous proposition. Right. Um, Dune, being on the sand is dangerous. Dune was really good for for this desert setting because it really amps up the, the the danger. Now there are little like water oasises within <laughs> within the book, and they explore those as kind of where where these people live. Uh, but the majority of the world is still covered in sand. Yeah. Uh, I think in later books they turned it into like a garden planet or oh something. Oh my god, later books, the, I mean, I actually stopped reading Dune, I think, after the fourth book. I think the last one I read was God Emperor Dune. I think that's the one that I, I started and I just said no, I'm not. Yeah, I think I read God Emperor Dune was the last one. I never read Chapter House Dune. Because I, 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 after God Emperor Dune, I was like, I, I don't know why I'm reading this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's like, I don't know. It's always on the same planet. It's like... But the characters are different, except for in God Emperor, where the, the one character... is like, a giant dude sandworm. He becomes a god of... Well, he becomes like a sandworm. half sandworm human thing. Yeah. 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 And it's like, all spice comes from me. I control the universe. It's like... Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. So, so I don't know. Dune is, a, is an interest. We should just spend, spend a... a it's been a podcast on Dune because it's a really interesting series. I, I think on there's people who really I think love the series, yeah. um, and then other people. I think most people are like me. They read the first book and they really like it, and then and then eventually they just sort of give up along the way uh, because it, you know, and you don't. You also don't feel like with any of those books you're moving towards some conclusion. Yeah. There's no. There's no like. It's not like Wheel of Time. Where you're reading the bad books of Wheel of Time and you're like, I know that this story I, ends. Yeah, I know that Tarmagaiden happens. <laughs> like I, just I know to see that. But yeah, I want to I want to know what happens at the end of the story. So I'm gonna read through I'm gonna read through these these sections. Like here's three chapters about parents standing around looking at the army. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, that, that happened. That's yeah. in that's in one of the books. Like the first three chapters are just like dudes standing around talking about a battle that happened in the other book. <laughs> Uh, another book that I think did the desert setting really well was uh, Dead House Gates, which is the second book of Malazan Book. Oh, of yeah. I like Dead uh, House Gates a lot. The Chain of Dogs. Yeah. Now, what, what happens in Dead House Gates is, again, we have these desert these desert natives. I mean, I don't know if you could call them natives, or but these desert inhabitants are culturally different than the Malazans. And this is because they grew up in a hostile desert environment. So in this hostile desert environment, they they have different rituals, they, they value different things, and because of that, it makes this particular continent very difficult for the Malazans to control. So... I think they talk in the book at at least of two different... They talk of the the original conquest and then of at least one kind of uprising where where this this place tries to break free of the the Malazan Empire. Yeah, they go into a rebellion. Yeah. And they're kind of initially successful. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And then in a later book, I... They, yeah, in in a later book... House of Chains... How, two books later, they they come back and just get they get wrecked. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. get completely wrecked, and yeah. then it's like it, and that's also serves the story because it lets you know just how powerful this Malazan Empire really yeah. is, like how good it, how good at what they what they what good they do. good they are what they do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a there's they explore that setting in a bunch of different ways. They explore it with an army that's basically running away from another army. Yeah. Trying to protect like all these civilians. And it's just a brutal, long, epic, endless battle. It's yeah. really, really, really well done. Um, and that's the one that people really remember. But there's also these uh, this other smaller group of characters that escapes from this um, this mine uh, where they mine oh, out yeah. this like anti magic 
mineral yeah. called the Tatteral. And uh, it's them fleeing that. And if, in order to flee, they have to go across the desert. Yeah. <clears throat> and they have to go across the desert and all these different, you know, all these different obstacles are in their way. And, of course, um, you're dealing with loss of water. And um, yeah. the desert also can be like a very spiritual place. And he kind of explores that because it's so desolate. Yeah. You have to think of like the Israelites wandering in the desert for 40 years. Which they couldn't have done without, like, the manna of heaven coming down to feed them. Right. Um, because it's completely impossible to survive. In the <laughs> that's, kind of what, that's kind of what makes it cool. Yeah. It's and, kind of like being on the moon, but you can breathe. Yeah, and this, I think, I think space is, a, is another good way to explore similar, um, similar themes that you explore in the desert. Um, so, yeah, I, I, actually, that the spiritual portion as well as the social portion portion because this this small group uh, in dead house gates are also a, basically a group of people that don't like each other yes uh, they 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 lived in this slave camp uh, many of them being former nobles of the Malazan empire and then being being cast out um, one of them actually uh, the sister to to one of the more important characters. Well, I mean, she's an important character too, but uh, one of the main characters, I would say, uh, in in the story. And so you're you're kind of dealing with knowing that this basically part of the story is the Empress tells the other character who's related to this one that that she's safe in this in this place until everything dies down and then they're going to bring her back. Uh, but then that's not what happens. She's like she gets sexually assaulted. Uh, then and she abused, becomes a and she becomes a prostitute, and then she like <sighs> becomes like this person's kind of wife. And then they kill this person, and then, <laughs> and then she escapes from this mine, and basically like she gets chewed up. She gets chewed up. Her story is very tragic, very yeah. tragic. And then when you get to she has so her growth curve is is like from from noble to like to nothing well to nothing, nothing but then to like conquistador basically yeah. <laughs> um, so she uh, she she goes from from you know uh, I don't want to. I don't want to say nobility, but I mean, like yeah, like nobility, monarch nobility, yeah, to despot <laughs> tyranny. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. So the desert, and and it, you get to this point where, like, you know, she goes through all these trials in the desert. And they barely survive, and like they're all changed. Um, and some of her friends have died along the way, and she gets to the end, and they're like, "You're the you're the prophetess." Mm -hmm. and well, no, she. She tells them that she's the pro she's just like because the desert has hardened her so much. Well, no, they, well she gets to the end and they're like, um, you know, it says that you know, she's like uh, they're like you're, are you the prophetess? And she, she's like I don't I don't know. And she's like, uh, you know, you have to be changed to be the prophetess. And she's like I I'm just this person. It's like the desert has changed you is what they say. It's like. Of course, of course you are. The desert has destroyed what you were, so that you could be yeah. this prophetess, so that you could be Shaikh. Shaikh, Shaikh reborn. Yeah, uh, because the original Shaikh is killed, and so she's just like, "Yep, that's me. I'm Shaikh." And, and but then it's then it becomes kind of true. Yeah, it, yeah. The desert really has hardened her to the point where she can be this brutal, uh, brutal, despotic. Yeah, uh, it's warfare. really. It's really awesome, and then in, in, in book four, they they resolve the whole thing in, in such a such a heartbreaking way, uh, yeah. which is which is so true to the style and, and, of the and series. You know, the, the way that they resolve it too, it's like there's been a tremendous build up to that to that tragic event happening, to where it's like a very, I mean, it's just it it, it was like a really perfect ending to, to the way yeah. that they set it up. <laughs> yeah, it was the way really that, great. that Steven Erickson said it up worked out really well. Really great. Um, some other things, I mean, there's there's plenty of times where I think desert environments done fairly badly. Um, 
where you essentially <clears throat> characters aren't really <laughs> aware of, of how bad the desert is. So I've seen movies where like people are walking around, they're like, the sun is so bright. It's like, you wouldn't walk during the sunlight in the desert. Yeah. You just wouldn't do it. Uh, it'd, it'd be too hot. It would, it would, uh, you'd die of exposure. So you, you know, you really only need to walk through the desert during the, during the night. And so like I, in the gunslinger, he's like walking around during the day. It's like, you actually wouldn't do that. <laughs> and not if you really cared about yourself or your shirt on water. Cause the other thing is too, you're sweating. That and, sweat is, and that sweat is is water you have to replace. So you want to reduce the amount of, of time you spend sweating, so that you have less water to replace. Um, now, what was there was a movie with uh, Vin Diesel? Um, oh, it Pitch was, Black. Yeah, Pitch Black. It was before it was before these Chronicles of Riddick, which which was what this movie spawned. And if I'm remembering right, it was a it was a desert planet. And it had all these like crazy monsters on it, but he was the only person to have ever survived on this planet. So these other oh, characters, no, it, it, he could see in the dark, is what it was. So what? It, so yeah. yeah. So so it was a desert planet. The desert really doesn't come into play though, because they just don't even. It, it's a desert planet, but they don't even really interact with it. Well, I guess I guess that my point was they have to interact with it in that they can only interact with the environment at night. Oh yeah. Well, it, it 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 becomes like a permanent night, yeah, because of an eclipse. Oh, and, that's and right. And they figure out the eclipse is going to last like a, a really long time, and that's when all these monsters come out to breed and yeah. do all this other kind of stuff. So it was a really, I think, I think it was actually a pretty effective horror movie. Yeah, overall. that was um, sci-fi horror. I was, I was really in. I it's thought not the best, but it's it works. I thought that the Chronicles of Riddick were, was interesting because I thought Riddick was such an interesting character, but I never, I. Even they though really he's played by, of... like, a board with a scary face on it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was... What I felt like is they, they took what was interesting about the original movie and... Got, I mean, because the Riddick movies... It. The Riddick movies weren't really horror. They were action. Yeah, the and, Riddick movies were, were basically, like, fantasy action. Yeah, and, and the Chronicle... And Pitch Black was horror movie. Or, you know, sci-fi horror. Yeah, it was that's, full-on sci-fi horror. And uh, I really like... I mean, genre-specific. Yeah, that's that's one of the things. If you if you break genre, especially in sequels, I it's think not that's usually gonna, a good idea. Yeah, it's gonna ruin your your fan base, your original fan base. Yeah, Alien never did that. Yeah, all the Alien movies, including Prometheus, they're all. Now we need to do a podcast specifically on Prometheus because there is a lot of hate out there. Yeah, a lot of people hate on Prometheus. Um, I thought it was really effective. I <laughs> I loved Prometheus, and you know even uh, even Sargon was hating on Prometheus, and I gotta tell you, man. I, love I, I think, uh, you know, and Prometheus is an interesting study on people's expectations. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, basically people's expectations. Because it didn't fulfill what people's expectations were. But I had no expectations. Yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah. that was really it. I had no expectations. I just thought it was visually stunning. It did sci-fi horror really well. You know, the characters act as characters in sci-fi horror do. Yeah. You know? the, who, is the monster us or is the monster the monster? Yeah. You know, so there's like, I, I <clears throat> yeah, we, we could do a podcast that's just on that. Um, as far as wrapping up desert, is there any other stuff that we really want to talk about with the desert? Don't, don't do a desert setting unless you intend to use the environment as part of the story, I guess yeah. would be my advice. Uh, yeah. Because if it's just window dressing, then... Then it's not a good window dressing. It's not. It's not the best window dressing. Like uh, forests are better. Uh, for I mean, like a richer environment. Plus, I can tell you, fine. the color brown gets tiresome, even Visually, if it's in your yeah. imagine. Even if it's in your imagination. Oh yeah. Um, because even at the end of Dune, or at the end of Deadhouse Gates, I was just sick of the desert. Uh, <laughs> it's it's tiring to read about. So unless you're, unless you are really invested in things that that. Or in conflicts that must happen in the desert, I would say um, uh, just avoid it. Yeah, we didn't talk about the desert and Wheel of Time. Yeah. So the desert and the Wheel of Time generates like a whole uh, set of people that have a specific culture that's built around around the desert. Yeah, conflict over water and things like that. You know, it's like oh, there's never they've never seen water that you can't step across. Yeah. 
which is, I mean, we did, we did talk about that in other settings, and that's something in, in the desert that you have to realize is that the, the people who are, are living in that environment are going to be culturally different than people who don't live in a desert environment, um, which is another great source of conflict. Yeah, think of like, um, you guys can remember, or if you've never seen it, you should probably watch it, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Um, and towards the beginning, he's with a, he's with an Arab and he kills another Arab. Like the Arab just kills this other guy because the other guy was getting water out of his well, out of a well that belonged to his tribe. And he's like, why did you just kill him? And he's like, he's a, he's a water thief and he's this other tribe. And it's like, you can't just kill him. It's like, he's, he's worthless. He's this other tribe, you know, like the, the, the tribal conflict is profound because resources are severely limited. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to do it for today, Riders of the Dawn. All right, this has been Stu. Where can we find you, Stu? Oh, davidvstewart.com, dvspress.com. Uh, this is Jay. You can find me at matthewjwellman.com. And that little bling will we'll tell us to the end. <laughs> We're at the end. Um, you can email the show at stu at davidvstewart.com. Y'all have a great day.